right, everybody, welcome to day three of theCUBE's coverage of VMware Explore 2024. I'm here with Rob Strecce. John Furrier flew out last night on the red eye. He's going to the US Open for another event uh, with our community. Uh, we are going deep. You know, a lot of people come in, they do the quick hits, they watch the keynote and they leave the cube. We go deep, we extract the signal from the noise. There's a lot of trauma and angst and confusion in the ecosystem, particularly the partner ecosystem, and we're going to dig into that and really cut through the noise with Brian Smith, who's the CEO of Expedient. Brian, welcome back to the Cube. Appreciate you having me on again. Yeah, thanks for your time. And um, you know, it's interesting. This is quite a different VMware Explorer. I mean, I had to, I got to say, last night I was looking for you guys at nine o'clock. There was kind of nobody around. Yeah. Walked by the old Circle Bar. It yeah. was, you know, people were, I guess, in bed. You know, getting ready for today. Yeah. So, uh, so I feel great. Yeah, <laughs> I wasn't up till, <laughs> till two, two a.m. and uh, or worse. But anyway. Brian, um, take us through, okay, we've lost the lights, but we'll keep going. Um, so what's your take on the whole Broadcom, VMware situation? How did it affect you guys? Give us the scoop. Yeah, I'd say the easiest is, it's been an emotional roller coaster, I think, for not only us and the partner community, but a lot of people. So the initial reaction was you know, the amount of change, the speed of change, and it just really, you know, people weren't, sure how to react, but you know, we pretty quickly really regrouped and pulled back to say, okay, with the new license model, with the new options, with the new capabilities, what does that mean? Are there ways that we can make adjustments that put us in a better situation than where we were? So we you know, quickly did that regroup, you know, re-architected some, some pieces, and we saw to do a minimal increase to the clients, but less than 5%, where you've heard, I think the, the storyline is much different than that for most and on our go forward, uh, even you know, better than that. Yeah. So I mean, what was the, can you take us through the timeline? So November of, of 20, no, this is May of 2022, you knew Broadcom was going to make the acquisition. You said, yep. okay, it's going to take a while. Um, you kind of knew what was going to happen, 63 billion. Hawk Dan came on to the Wall Street analyst and said, this is what I'm going to do. So there was no surprises here. Uh, but at the same time, you had to, as the head of the company, have to think about, all right, what does this mean for us? So you had some, I don't know, what, a year and a half to figure that out. And then November 2022, the acquisition you know, gets closed and they didn't waste any time making changes. So what was, what was the timeline for you guys? How did you navigate through that? What changes did you make? Yeah. How was it that you were able to absorb uh, the changes, what seemingly is better than some of the other well, companies? Well, the timeline was nowhere close to what you're laying out that you know, we found out the actual changes in January of this year. And so, you know, we essentially had to re-architect and replan the platform between January and March, and then uh, work on executing between March and September. So, you know, it's been a, all 2024 that we've made all of those changes and pivots. So you knew in November 22 that something was happening, but you didn't have the details. The until, devil is right. in the details. You didn't get those until January. Right. And then you had to pivot your entire team. But that was like all hands on deck, I presume. Absolutely. Okay, yeah. so what actions specifically did you take to prepare, and what was your message to customers during that transition period? Well, the, the first part was, you know, we knew things were changing, but it still wasn't documented until the March-April timeframe. You know, so we could communicate what we believed was going on, and we could start making adjustments, but the biggest thing that we saw was, you know, with we knew it was switching to cores from consumption of RAM for a service provider, you know, so we could you know, start doing the math of what that required, and we're a little bit different than some of our peer companies where 80% of our cloud uh, platform is actually multi-tenant, 20% private, so we have a lot more options to you know, make adjustments and control versus everything was just private. So the biggest thing we did was we had to separate the disaster recovery clients from production so that you know, we're not consuming the licenses as a service provider until they actually fail over and start uh, using it. So it's one of the big benefits a client can get that there's no change or no price increase on DR in that type of situation. So when you heard, and then Rob, you got to jump in here, but when you heard about the changes, like what did you do? Did you just call up your Broadcom you know, relationship person and you know, have an interesting conversation? Probably, like most did, but I'm sure you weren't able to change their mind. Um, so that's the point. You know, that initial shock um, led you to, okay, now, Let's go, fire drill. Yeah, I mean, I think our reaction, you know, the most common term I hear people use is pissed. And you know, that, so I think that was a common theme with, with people of where it was, but I think our level of that lasted much shorter than most because it was like, 
okay, how do we make adjustments? And I will say that you know, you know, Hawk gave us an audience that we had a one-on-one -on -one, you know, with him early, uh, like in Q1, to talk about what it was specific for a cloud service provider, what it meant, and from there, adjustments actually happened in the program. Uh, that actually made it a lot more usable, workable, so that we didn't have to make other you know, adjustments. It was some really quick changes. Was that, that a one-way conversation, or was it was it a give and take? No, it was definitely a give and take. Yeah, you know, because in because I would if I said something that he disagreed, we would challenge each other. And if you're willing to back up your facts and stuff, and have data and, and explain what the impact and cascade it all the way to the client then you know, that, those are the points where it really mattered. I think this is what we've been hearing from others is that Hawk really does very large pivots very, very quickly and then there's fine tuning that happens, almost like you know, bottles and stuff like that. And I, I think one of the things that I, I found interesting in some of the conversations was again that when we, we see people haven't gone through this, like the, the customers we're talking sure. to that are here, uh, a lot of them aren't where you are. They, they haven't really gone through and you know, internalized the trauma and gotten to the other side yet. And in fact, you guys are surveying some right. of them here at the booth, and, and I think you have some interesting you know, qualitative stats that have been going on. Why don't you tell the people what, what kind of that, the breakdown between hyperscaler, other hypervisors, and staying VMware, and how that's kind of shaking out. Yeah, so at our booth, we uh, put in an interactive display where people could just tap the touch screen to say, we asked a simple question of, where do your VMware workloads live in the future? And they could choose between, we're going to stay on VMware, we're going to move to a hyperscale, or we're going to move to an alternate hypervisor. And essentially 15% consistently say that they're going to move those to a hyperscale, and then it's fairly even split that say that they're going to stay on VMware, and about uh, the other, uh, 42 say they're going to uh, move to or investigate an alternate hyperscale or hypervisor. But what are, you, what are you seeing in actuality? Because I mean, again, this is now since January you've had to make your uh, you had to make your adjustments to your infrastructure to be able to. And having worked with Expedient on the DR side, I understand how that yeah. that's architected and some of the costs that could go with other other vendors who are doing it differently. How do you how do you look at it as a as a way that you've gotten through the trauma and been able to keep it to, like you said, only a 5% increase, yet people who maybe are not sweating the asset of that server are seeing much greater uh, sure. you know, cost changes in that. Yeah, I'd say that we have some you know, unique perspective because we're not just kind of the highest tier partner with VMware, we have the same higher, highest tier of cloud service provider with Nutanix, so there's the sentiment of what we're going to do, but then there's the action. And we've seen 70% of people stay on VMware when they actually are moving forward, and 30% have you know, chosen a Nutanix platform when they're looking at cloud options. And some of the changes were you know, starting to investigate DR first, because you can move the fastest there because you're not disrupting the business. Some of the, the fastest cost savings that people can have. And then it's looking at you know, what are you really consuming or not, because most companies are, consume, or are provisioned for about 40% more than they need. You know, so, because they purchased assets and with the, that they're going to grow into it over time and they just plug them in and power them on. And so they need to think about how they architect internally, but then that changes how they monitor, how they do capacity management. There's lots of cascading if you're doing it all internal versus uh, if you move on to a service rider, you're not having to work those pieces, but also you're not making the decision of all the different components underneath. It's more like you could uh, build your own car by buying all the pieces from the parts department, or from our perspective, it's like you're trying to buy reliable transportation. And so we give the outcome versus you know, worrying about all the components. Can we double click into those workloads? So DR is one that's low risk, yep. you know, you're saying, because you're not actually using it every day, hopefully. Right. Um, okay, so that can move. What is, what else is moving? And I'm really interested in what's not moving. Like what's the business case uh, to move and, not, and, and to stay? Well. A lot of it is, if you take the emotion out of the conversation in two ways, one, that if, if you don't incur the big price increase, that removes a large portion of the emotion, right? And so, but then you still like, well, I didn't like how they treated me, and they, so there's still some overhang there. Then the second is that you know, we can do analysis and actually show them their data and show them the different risk points that they have and where there's options to uh, really optimize the environment. So it's going through in a much more factual component by in removing all the emotion is how you can accelerate and, and get to the impact. So it, broadly speaking, if I'm running mission critical workloads, 
uh, presumably you're not going to just rip and replace those or nope. move those, right? Because it's just too risky to the business. So that's, I, mean, I think we can agree, that's very clearly staying. Yep. And you're probably better off going all in on the VCF stack than you are trying to mi migrate. Migrate's an evil word. Yep. But sometimes I call them craplications. Those are lower risk. Are those the ones that you're seeing moving? Not really, it's, it's really an all or nothing. That, really? Yeah, we're not, we're, we're not seeing people pick from, I would say that's true with different hypervisors. We'll see people do hybrid, that they'll move certain applications to hyperscale and keep VMware or keep something, but I, we're not seeing people do partial VMware, partial some other hypervisor. It, it's really been an all or nothing in those situations. So when they, when they do, so we, I think we, we, were, we were in agreement that the mission critical stuff's not moving. Is that, is that fair or are you seeing mission critical work moving yeah, as well? Ab absolutely, we'll see people, like if they look at the environment, they'll make the call to move everything to a different hypervisor or stay on, they're not doing onesie twosie. It's more that they're looking ways to minimize their cost immediately in the mission critical and then plan long term for what, what they do. So if you're running your business on VMware and you got transaction systems running, are you seeing those moving to a new hypervisor at yeah. this point? Really? Uh, so far this year, we've had 70% of the cloud deals we've done stay on VMware and 30% move onto Nutanix. No, I hear you on that. Yeah, but, 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 so that's the entire environment. Are, that's, oh, the, so that's full environment, that's not a subset. No, I understand the, the subset or not. But I, I guess I'm surprised to hear that they're they're essentially migrating those mission critical applications. I, th I think it's 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 a different view from a service provider view versus if you're uh, internal IT where you may already be running different hypervisors internally already or different Kubernetes stacks and things like that where. With, when you're contracting, you're probably contracting for one side or the other and keeping it all together. You can abstract that. that complexity is what exactly. you're saying. Absolutely, they're essentially owning the applications, the OS up, and you know, we can even do the OS if they want, so that all those other components underneath, they can, we do co-manage that they can log in and twist the knobs and push the buttons, or they can just have us do the entire platform. But, and do you freeze the applications when you migrate? that it, what it feels like a reboot to them because we, we actually will move it over and they can uh, spin it up in a su subnet, different subnet, like a test bubble to see that it all works and everything before they're committing the failover. So it yep. feels like a reboot at the time uh, of the migration. And I think one of the things that we've been hearing from customers is that, uh, and I think to, you know, to Brian's point was the fact that the abstraction of that, and this is something that it hadn't really dawned on me, it's like, okay, if I'm going to go in with the whole VCF stack, I now have to convince my Arista slash Cisco guys to take on NSX, or to take on the Broadcom networking stack. And for that, it's abstracted in what they're doing. And, right. and I think that's got to be a big piece for customers coming to you is like, I'm, I'm just going to focus on the apps. I'm going to, in that, you know, cohabitating space there. Well, and, and specifically when people talk about their cloud transformation and stuff, a lot of that is about how they're modernizing their, how they behave in their applications. So if you take out all the noise of the, all the day two operations and, and the firefighting, remove all of that, people really get a lot of cycles to focus on the application side, so it accelerates the speed that actually get the transformation benefit. Yeah. So VMware is making the case, uh, forcefully, uh, and they've got data to back it up, that, that the TCO of staying and going all in on VCF is attractive, more than attractive, it's cheaper than the cloud, they're making that case, you heard that, you've heard that frequently, but also they're you know, sharing data that it's significantly less expensive you know, than, than other alternatives. So, when you do the TCO analysis, I mean, it's never black and white. There's always, there's always a way to break the TCO, we know this. So where does it make sense to stay and where does it make sense to move in your experience? Yeah, that, <clears throat> I, I guess I think I <clears throat> have a pretty good sense on the TCO because I understand my cost per unit on everything. Right. Uh, so I, I <laughs> Most so, customers don't. <laughs> right, <laughs> yeah. uh, of all the different subcomponents yeah. that, that make up the solution. So if you are using at least you know, three of the different components in VCF, you know, that's kind of the, the piece where we've seen that you know, you're getting yeah. the value. So like as we re-architected, like I said, we passed through less than a 5%, but the new platform we're building is, has a lower cost basis than previous. You know, so the, by using the other components, we actually are recognizing and seeing that, op that option. And my understanding is they've, they've helped me get this right. That my understanding is they've done the hard work 
that it used to be if you were in vSphere and you got to go to VMware Cloud Foundation, it was a, a, a migration, a rip and replace. They've done the work to make that basically transparent. Um, yeah, I mean, is that it's, nine? It's, is that uh, yeah, it's version with nine? nine and okay, it's so that's actually was in, not it out was yet. In what, right? Well, it, it, it's in it's in I believe five what it was five two I, the previous. It's in five two. Version. Okay, so so it it does. They've done a lot of the hard work to make sure that you could migrate between the, the couple, but I think part of it is you're just taking on much more. If you were just vSphere and you weren't using, to your point, all the other th you know, two or three other components, they, that was a big, if you weren't using vSAN, it's a big migration. But if, but if you're going to a service provider, you're, yeah. you're bringing your data, you're bringing your apps, you're bringing all of that up there. And so I, I think to Hawk's point, when he decided not to go cloud two years ago with the Broadcom TCO, and he talks yep. about this all the time, he said, you know, basically it's because we run our assets at you know 92% you know efficiency or you know fullness and keep that factory. That has to be a, a factor in what you're able to achieve because you know the unit cost. You know, inside your multi-tenant environment, how is it impacting? the ones that are not multi-tenant. I, I think that's that's the question I have because I think that for those folks, sure. it's got to be a different story. Yeah, I mean, the, for those folks, we had about a 15% price increase. So it was still nowhere close to the percentage you're hearing other places, uh, but you know, there was definitely a bigger increase for those. And the biggest reason for there is you have more overhead because the redundancy servers that are in the mix, you know, previously in a service provider side were zero because there was no RAM being consumed, you know, but now we pay for those cores. And, and is that unique to Expedience specifically and generally cloud service providers? Um, or I would expect not all customers are going to see that uh, advantage, that benefit of a, a relatively small increase. Well, you're right, because I mean, there were still components that we had to change on the back end to make those things work, but also such as like you know, writing automation that auto adds and removes hosts into the stack so that it, we're automatically doing capacity management uh, instead of having to, so you can run at a higher capacity but not run the risk of running up against a capacity threshold of auto adding and removing things. So VMware is, again, these are the averages of the averages with a lot of fine print, okay? They're saying 55% savings uh, on infrastructure, 31% on facilities, 42% increased labor productivity, uh, this is with VCF um, relative to native public cloud. They're overall they're saying 40% savings. So I guess going on-prem to on-prem with VCF, you have 51% savings and the cost is 40% more attractive than public cloud. I'm assuming, I mean I don't know if that sounds reasonable, but I'm assuming that uh, there's an assumption in there that that's if you're using at least three components. That's if you're using yeah. everything, I believe. And that, this is probably if you're all in. It's all in. Okay, which is not the common. I mean, what percent of the customers are using everything? I mean, it's got to be. Well, we know that there's less than 25% using at least two. Yeah, so there you go. Wow. Yeah. Okay, so this is this is the playbook. Yeah. It's like. It's a long term. You're, you're right, you're going to, this, this is the reality. We're going to deliver this value, but there's, um, there's a knot hole that they got to get through. Yep. Um, and so, uh, and, and if in fact, the migration is that easy, you know, that's obviously a, a, a risk, but it's not that easy for all customers. It's easy because you've got that. Yeah, we've done thousands service. of them. I mean, we do it every week. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> right. And that's you know, part of the benefit is, if you want to get there, you can spend nine to 12 months doing it yourself, or you can be there in 30 days. But, but I think this is also where, where it helps and it is part of Hawk's plan, and we've heard this this week, is that I want, I want the partners to be able to do the services and build services around right. VCF and make revenue there. Because, the, and he's, he's been very clear that there's certain things he wants to, VMware to do, and professional services is not one of them. And I, I think that's where this makes sense. It's very cloud-like. Yeah, well, but it's what he, but when he <laughs> looks at it, he goes, He's, his cloud comments, and it, I, we know because we heard through the grapevine that it pissed off Microsoft and Google, his comments already, but you know, we're more aimed at the hyperscalers, and I, I think that, you know, again, this part of it, there's still money to be made, and obviously, and there's still things to be. I mean, in his played. keynote, he said, you're basically getting AWS on-prem. Now, in the analyst session, he wasn't as, um, as forceful on it. He, I don't want to say he backed off that, he didn't. He, he said, 
you basically get you know, substantially equivalent function right. as you would an AWS. And, and you know, when pushed a little bit, he said, look, we're not going to replicate all 300 services that they have. We're going to cherry pick the top 30. Sure. And, and so I guess my question to you, Brian, is do, do you, do you, could you, can you support that statement that it, it is substantially similar to an AWS experience, or maybe even better in some I, cases. Well, I, I think he's got a great example here because he's going to be leaving us and going and actually talking about private AI and how they're doing Hit private me. AI. <laughs> yeah, so to your statement, I think that that's where they're trying to get to. Yeah. Uh, today, you know, it's going to be more efficient for running uh, VMs or consistently consumed container environments that from performance and cost, definitely is a better platform for that. As you start using some of the different microservices and stuff, I still think hyperscale is at an advantage right now, but that's what they're trying to catch up to for some of those components. What, um, what are your customers doing for the data stack? This is something that's been bugging me. The, the, I, I see that as a gap in VMware's strategy. I know they got Tanzu and that's sort of their developer play. Okay, check that box, that's, that's what they've got. Um, good, bad, ugly, whatever you, you can say about that, they at least have a play there. Their data play, it tends to be MySQL, Postgres, uh, Greenplum. Yeah. Uh, it just doesn't vector, seem yeah. to be hyperscale equivalent. So what are your customers doing there? Are, they sort of, are you helping them bring in their own data stack? What's that look like? Yeah, that, you know, well, I think that's what they're trying to build too because if you t uh, talk to VMware about their roadmap, it's to add more capabilities so you have more of an RDS type of uh, environment. So, our target customer is probably a little down the stack you know, from you know, some of the people that are really heavy you know, users in those environments. So mid-market, small enterprise, and then, but it's the people that want to have access, like you were talking on the AI side, it's how you help guide them to different platforms or connect to their data where it is today is how we've helped people because we know that they're not going to just be able to move everything. So we've started first with connect to where it is, make it available. Once you prove that that's the data you need, for example, for AI, then building the automated pipelines that move it into AI ready storage in a vector store so that they can leverage, use it, and then put all the security controls and stuff around it. So from your standpoint, how would you summarize the the, 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 mid to, the mid term effect on Expedient in terms of this change, is it, a, is it a positive, a negative, or a neutral? Yeah, I would put it in the highly positive, you know, because, and the main reason is, these were workloads that sat in the background that just worked and nobody wanted to talk about. They only wanted to have a conversation of the new shiny thing they were building, and it forced the conversation to be had. No matter where it goes, they have to have a conversation of what do we do with this workload and ask a lot of questions, and when you do that, it uncovers a lot of areas of potential inefficiency or things that were hiding in the background. So just by having the conversation has been incredibly positive from, uh, from our perspective. And, and as a CEO, you understand markets and, and, and total available market and TAM expansion. When you look at, when you step back and, and look at the strategy that Broadcom is affecting, and you think about the ecosystem and the, the dollars in that ecosystem, it's, it's enormous. I mean, it, it's, it's tens of billions of dollars, maybe 30, 40, right. maybe even 50 or more billion. So that TAM doesn't go away. It, it probably continues to expand. VMware's TAM, or serve market, could contract, but the profitability of that is going to be substantially higher. Is that right. the right way to think about it, and that is a positive, a highly positive for you guys. I believe so, and especially the way that they've changed the partner market by focusing on kind of that highest pinnacle group and forcing that down, they're moving a lot of the level one and level two support for the end user to us. Uh, so it makes it more efficient, but then that drives clients to us as well. So when anyone who doesn't have 60 or 61% operating margin, this is great for them, which is, by the way, nobody except Broadcom. <laughs> and so, you know, if you're running like a normal business, this is, this is great business for you guys, and uh, you welcome it. Yeah, that, that creating that conversation you know, has really put us back in a strategic conversation with people, and less of a technology conversation because it's happening at the CFO and CEO level where it's made them wake up and then have a broader technology and direction conversation. Now, Brian, thanks for coming on theCUBE and helping us unpack uh, all this data. We're trying to get to the truth, and it was super helpful. Thank you. Thanks for having me. All right, keep it right there. Rob Stretchy and I will be back live from VMware Explore 2024 from Las Vegas. Keep it right there. <laughs>